Good morning and thanks to all of you who are following in the United States and around the world. I would like to remind you that interpretations are available in six languages by clicking on the globe below your screen and closed captioning is available by clicking on CCC on CC icon below your screen. It's my honor to welcome you to this high level event on gender based violence in the context of COVID-19, which takes place on the margins of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. My name is Rula Jibreel, and I'll be your host and master of ceremonies today. I would be remiss not to begin by noting what I am sure is in everyone's mind. Our event is convened in the shadow of the passing of perhaps the most influential female jurist in world history, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg's in transformational role in shaping US law in the areas of equality and women's rights have had ripple effects far beyond America's shore. Our ability to hold this forum is in part a function of her influence. I must also acknowledge and salute the singular leadership shown by women in our world today, from Chancellor Angela Merkel to Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern. This is a time when we are rightly claim that leader, women leader, have not merely shown that they are equal to men in the task of national leadership, but often they surpass them. Indeed, it has not escaped recognition that nations led by women have overall been the most effective in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Even on a local level, Japan's governor of Tokyo, Yuriko Koyoke, has demonstrated remarkable skills in bravely and calmly guiding that city through what otherwise might have been a catastrophe. All that notwithstanding, our event spotlights on one of the, one of the indirect consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic and its attended lockdown, which is the deplorable escalation in gender-based violence we have witnessed and documented in all countries around the world. While lockdown condition helped avoid virus transmission, they also led to a pandemic within a pandemic. For millions of women, there also been an increase of domestic violence and other form of violence as sexual assault, physical and emotional abuse and cyberbullying carried out by predator who often happen to be partners, husbands, or fathers. Even in benign homes all around the world, stories proliferate of the external increase in domestic burden faced by women. They've been forced to shoulder added duties as a result of school closing and widespread work from home practices. To this added the sobering pressure of financial strain. As always, it is women who must close the gaps. More malevolently, women have been trapped with their male abusers in their own homes. Girls have been targeted online. In, in other cases, women and girls have been sexually harassed in the streets, now devoid of pedestrian traffic, as so many people shelter in place. In many countries, including in Western democracies, such as Italy, when women attempted to go to the police, they were told that they are breaking lockdown rules and then turned away. Early on, an alarm was sounded about all of this by women's rights organizations, by NGOs and the United Nations and other stakeholders. However, mostly it fell on deaf ears as government deemed these to be issues of insufficient consequence to require putting mechanisms in place to protect women. Early this year, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres 
amidst repeated appeals for a ceasefire in conflicts around the world to focus on the shared struggle against the coronavirus, also courageously called for a ceasefire in homes. As a result, we have seen a positive response and analysis conducted by UN Women have shown that 135 countries have taken robust measures to address violence against girls and women. These include novel approaches to ensure that women have access to information, counseling, support, and domestic violence shelters, even under COVID-19 conditions. Although still limited, we also have seen some investment being made to scale up existing mechanisms. Today's event will provide us with a snapshot of some best practices which need to be amplified, promoted, and funded, and may be replicated in many other places. To set, our, to set the stage for our event, I have the great honor to invite UN Secretary General Guterres to deliver the opening address. Gender-based violence is a global scourge, and the COVID-19 pandemic is exacerbating it in all its forms, from domestic violence to sexual abuse, online harassment, and increased child marriage. Millions of women are living in fear, with long-term consequences for families and communities, and for all our efforts for peace and security, human rights, and sustainable development. At the start of the pandemic, I made a global appeal to end all violence, from war zones to people's zones. I urge governments to prioritize preventing and ending gender-based violence in their response plans for COVID-19. Some 146 member states and observers answered the call. They have increased resources and taken innovative action to protect women and girls. These measures are welcome, but they are not enough. We urgently need new thinking and momentum on this critical issue. Together, we must tackle male violence that affects everyone and damages everyone. We need to increase accountability and question attitudes and approaches that enable violence. And we must provide resources for women's civil society organizations on the front lines. In the coming months, I will engage with member states, civil society, face leaders and the private sector to launch a new push for progress. We will build on the Spotlight Initiative, our partnership with the European Union, to end all forms of violence against women and girls. Today's event is an important opportunity to raise awareness, share best practice, and move to action. Together, let us redouble our efforts to end gender-based violence during COVID-19 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Today, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Today, we also are emphasizing the importance of joint leadership and concrete action across governments, civil society, and the private sector, philanthropic organizations, youth, and other stakeholders to address violence against women and girls. We also need concrete and measurable funded commitment to make this progress. In this regard, and I'm pleased to introduce a joint statement by the leaders of the Generation Equality Action Coalition on gender-based violence. We, the co-leaders of the Generation Equality Forum Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence, note with alarm and call upon all actors to immediately respond with targeted and effective actions to the emerging evidence that multiple forms of gender-based violence, in particular intimate partner violence, have intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic. The pervasive endemic nature of gender-based violence against women and girls is rooted in structural gender inequality and discrimination. Gender-based violence is a women's human rights violation of pandemic proportions, which was prevalent before the COVID-19 crisis and if not addressed with a gender transformative approach will persist once the crisis has passed with serious consequences and life-threatening impacts for women and girls around the world who will pay the highest price. 
We stand with the 146 member states and observers who answered the United Nations Secretary General's call to action to make prevention and redress of violence against women and response to GBV a key part of response to COVID-19. All interventions must be responsive to the needs and address the vulnerabilities of young women and adolescent girls, as well as for those who face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. We urge all actors to recognize GBV as a global long-standing emergency, addressing it with absolute urgency and with the political will, resources, and accountability mechanisms required to respond to other emergencies of this scale. To provide core, sustainable, and multi-year funding for women and girl-led women's rights organizations, as well as women's human rights defenders and peace builders at every stage of response and recovery from COVID-19. To ensure accountability for GBV is shared widely across the global humanitarian response plan through concrete actions and implementation targets. To innovate and adapt evidence-based GBV prevention and response activities. To recognize as essential and fund comprehensive services for GBV survivors, including women and girls specialized services, such as helplines, shelters, safe accommodation, first line support, and clinical care for rape and intimate partner violence. As a part of broader and comprehensive evidence-based prevention strategies and related efforts with a view to building back better after COVID-19, support the partnership of men and boys, organizations with women's and girls' rights activists and organization to transform harmful social norms and promote gender equality and non-acceptability of violence against women and girls, to improve access to justice for women and girls, survivors of the GPV, including survivors of sexual violence, and deal with any backlog of cases that may have been created due to lockdown measures related to the COVID-19 pandemic. To ensure that girls, including adolescent girls and young women, can safely return to and stay in school and educational institutions, which can be transformative in transforming and preventing gender-based violence, including online violence and harmful practices such as child, alien, forced marriage, and female genital mutilation. To implement gender-sensitive social protection and safety nets, which have been proven effective at mitigating the impact of GBV. To recognize that women's labor force participation, economic empowerment, and financial independence is crucial to address and to eradicate gender-based violation. This is especially critical in the context of COVID-19. To address the various risks and use of digital and mobile technologies in perpetrating harm and violence towards women and girls by ensuring the safety of digital spaces to encourage the international community and member states to strengthen and coordinate safe and ethical data collection, reporting, and better understand the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence against women and girls. We call upon international financial institutions, the private sector, philanthropic organizations, and the wider UN system to ensure that funding for gender equality is included in multilateral investment and financing. Looking forward, we, the colleagues, will work to stop any reversal of the hard won progress on advancing gender equality and women and girls' empowerment due to the COVID 19 pandemic. Efforts to build back better after the COVID 19 pandemic must be a women and girls' edges in their heart and tackle longer term structural and core root causes of gender based violence. We stand in solidarity with the co-leads and the membership of all the Generation Equality Forum Action Coalitions, acknowledging that progress on one area of gender equality, such as addressing gender-based violence, is inextricably interlinked with progress in others, and that we must galvanize action across the board to meet all of the sustainable development goals by 2030.
Thank you for that powerful statement. For those who would like to read the full statement, please visit Generation Equality Forum website, forum.generationequality.org. Women's organizations have always been on the front lines of the fight against gender-based violence. We will now hear from the grantees of the UN Trust Fund to end violence against women. They will share with us their demand for a robust response. The civil society organization. Nosotras. The women's rights organizations. Ask the United Nations member states to support our work during the COVID-19 crisis. By recognizing that domestic violence has been the silent pandemic within this pandemic. By acknowledging the global increase in violence against women and girls. By increasing long-term resources to local women-led organizations. By investing in women's agency by ensuring continuous financial support, by continuing to provide the financial and technical resources, more funding and capacity to grassroots organizations who are at the front line of this fight, by recognizing our voice for a disability inclusive COVID-19 prevention and response by investing in local women's organizations by recognizing our role as first responders by acknowledging our role in providing immediate support to survivors of violence by recognizing our role as the first defender of the Woman and Investing in women's rights organizations means leaving no woman behind. And by doing this, we'll ensure that the gains that we have made so far do not roll back and we are able to, to achieve gender equality. And therefore, put the necessary resources to end violence against women. Our belief and drive is that no woman should go through violence as long as we are there. Thank you. To, to conclude this opening segment, I would like to invite the Executive Director of UN Women, Kumzule Malambo Nuga, to deliver her opening remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much to all the colleagues who already presented uh, statements. Uh, over the past several months, we have seen governments and other partners take a swift action to address gender-based violence during COVID-19 pandemic. But we've also seen failures and neglect of women and fault lines. And I think the last video uh, speaks to that. Uh, the positive actions that we have seen that we want to learn from include women's rights organizations, uh, integrating and ending violence against women uh, through actions that uh, they took as they were implementing the response to the pandemic and their plans for recovery plan for the recovery actions. Uh, we have seen uh, responses that include provision of essential services to survivors of violence, a prevention of violence against women through awareness raising and social protection, and the collection of data to inform the policies and programs in, in many countries and to enable us to plan 
better with reliable data. There has also been significant innovation that we've seen at this time with the adaptation of services uh, for the use of technology, the strengthening of multisectoral pan partnerships and multilateralism. The UN EU Spotlight Initiative programming clearly demonstrated these across five regions, and we also saw the need to do more of this work. UN Women has been grateful to be in partnership with many of you, and of course is here to continue to work together for the long haul through the planned activities of generation equality. The pandemic has forced us all to think differently and to rebuild better. And that is what we now need to spell out in much more details. What does it mean to build back better in the context of violence against women, for instance? Uh, one of the ways in which we are going to build back better, it is going to be through generation equality. And again, you have heard the statement from the leaders of the Action Coalition on gender-based violence of generation equality. This is the first ever multi-stakeholder and intergenerational platform with the objective of creating a compelling political compact and driving long-term change to end GBV. The action coalitions are not just in gender-based violence. We have got also a, a coalitions in the other topics of generation equality. But in these coalitions, we bring together in the, in the gender-based uh, uh, violence, for instance, that coalition brings back member states, uh, youth, uh, private sector, researchers and academics, UN agencies, and UN Women and WHO are the two uh, UN agencies that are going to be supporting this particular action coalition. This partnership model builds on ways we are already supporting governments and other stakeholders through extensive global policy and thought leadership that uh, has made sure that uh, we establish a very healthy and, and, and good working relations, relations with stakeholders. So in 28 countries, for instance, work with governments to integrate GBV measures into their COVID-19 response and fiscal stimulus packages. And we support 44 countries to continue legal and policy reforms on violence against women and harmful practices. In Liberia, our continuous advocacy with CSO and through Spotlight resulted in government declaring a national emergency on rape we support women with cash transferred and broader social protection measures. We build our partnerships with private sector and major technology platforms to adapt services to survivors and address impunity through police justice response in 40 countries. Our offices around the world have partnered with tech giants like Google, Twitter, Facebook to provide important information about helpline services for domestic survivors. For example, WhatsApp in Zimbabwe is supporting youth leaders. And for women at global level, we partnered with Global Network for Women's Shelters and National Network for Ending Domestic Violence to build a global repository of helplines for gender-based violence along with, his, with Facebook. In countries where the digital divide is larger, we build our partnership with a civil society organization and traditional and faith leaders to increase community outreach and COVID. This morning uh, already, uh, because I'm in a different time zone than New York, uh, we already had a very interesting discussion with traditional leaders who are warning us about the increase in child marriage, but some of them who are also sharing the steps they have taken, including passing bylaws by in their chiefdoms that uh, are able to stop violence against women and intervene when there is a forced uh, marriage in their community. In uh, Mal Malawi, we have supported the establishment of, of, the, of the National Faith Leaders uh, uh, Platform. But I have to say, this is not enough because the problem is so big. There is still much more to do. And that is why we need this coalition. 
Uh, to get real-time information, we have conducted rapid assessment surveys in over 30 countries and tracked the gender equality content on policy responses, including on GBV in 136 countries working together with UNDP. We will embark on new partnership to collect critical data on violence against women in 25 countries and strengthen our methodologies, including in humanitarian settings. I'm proud that uh, more than 80% of women's spotlight partners are local grassroots organizations, many with special focus on the needs of marginalized groups of women who most need our support, like the local NGOs we support. In Papua New Guinea, for instance, we work with disabled women, transgender and L LGBTQ populations and women living with HIV. And I would also like today to announce that our UN Trans Fund to End Violence Against Women, which is managed by UN Women on behalf of the UN system, has responded rapidly in its network of 144 civil society organizations. 59% 59, 59 of which are women's organizations and, and across 69 countries. And they are made up of women all walks of life who are human phenomena. Uh, the trust fund has approved an immediate reallocation of existing funds to enable civil society organizations to respond efficiently to pressing challenges and safely and the safety of their staff and to ensure institutional sustainability, manage potential organizational risk, and make sure that women and girls receive essential support. In May 2020, in partnership with Spotlight Initiative, the European Union, uh, the UN Trust Fund allocated 9 million US dollars for immediate needs to all the existing grantees in Sub-Saharan Africa in the context of COVID-19. The latest UN Trust Fund assessment released today underlines these needs showing, for example, that grantees operating, are operating shelters to protect women uh, who are escaping violence uh, in countries, including Ethiopia, India, Iraq, Liberia, Mongolia, and Tunisia. And they are all reporting rapid increase in intake since the pandemic. Hardships and vulnerability to violence is accelerated when women have to sell land to survive as grantees, such as has been reported in Bangladesh. With the UN Trust Fund support, uh, civil society organizations are able to adapt their responses. For example, the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa and South Sudan helps girls and women recover economically by training them in production of masks and reusable, reusable sanitary pads. Innovation and organizations like this are, are key to our response and we need these for the long term. Today, I'm also delight, delighted to announce that the UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women will invest 11 million US dollars to further support such effort. This new funding has, made, has been made possible by the generous contributions of a number of member states and we thank them for that. Again, these, as I say, are many significant actions, but the challenges are just as many. So there is room for all of us to continue to collaborate and to expand our work. We encourage others to follow suit with flexible funding and to engage women's expertise and women's organization in all parts of the world. In these efforts of mobilizing women to end gender-based violence, we also must make sure that we, we leave no one to be a bystander. I thank you for your participation today and for the continued engagement uh, and fight against uh, gender-based violence. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Under Secretary General. Before we move to the first high level round table, it's my distinct pleasure to invite the European Commissioner for International Partnerships to deliver a message. I want to remind everybody that the European Union has been a significant partner to the UN on addressing gender-based violence, notably through EU UN Spotlight Initiative, which represent the largest ever single investment 
in official development assistance on addressing violence against women and girls. I would like to introduce to you Ms. Yuta Europlanian. The floor is yours, ma'am. Every human being has the right to live a life free from all forms of violence. Still, many forms of violence against women and girls persist in every country in the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased levels of violence globally, including in Europe. This needs to stop now. Last April, 146 countries joined the EU statement in support of the United Nations Secretary General's call for peace in homes around the world. In the coming months, the EU will present an ambitious new action plan as a contribution to gender equality in the world. A global problem requires a global solution. Three years ago, here at UNGA, the EU joined forces with the United Nations and launched the Spotlight Initiative to eliminate violence against women and girls. The Spotlight is up and running already in 25 countries and six regions. It adopts a comprehensive approach, including prevention and awareness raising, legislation support, protection and access to services, and support to women's organizations. Spotlight is about working together with partner countries, civil society, girls and boys, traditional and religious leaders. It will support the work of the Action Coalition. Together, we can make a difference. There is no other way. Thank you, Commissioner. It's now time to move to our first high level round table. This round table will focus on proven solutions and policies to address gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. It will moderate this session, Sarah Hendricks, Director of Policy and Program and Intergovernmental Support Division at UN Women. Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Rula. And indeed, a warm welcome to all participants, partners, and colleagues from all over the world who are here. I'm super honored to be here with you today to moderate this high-level roundtable on proven solutions and policies to address gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. And when we zoom out and think about the context we're in, we reflect on how 25 years ago, <laughs> decision makers committed during the fourth UN World Conference on Women to achieve gender equality, to achieve women's empowerment across 12 areas, including ending all forms of violence against women and girls. Today, no country has achieved gender equality and really concrete change is needed more than ever before especially when we think about how COVID-19 really acts as a magnifying glass, both revealing and also intensifying existing gender inequalities. There's also an opportunity, and that's what our conversation today is going to be about, an opportunity to rebuild a safer, a more equal, a more sustainable world a world really promised to all the girls in Beijing in 1995, a world where all women and girls live their lives free of violence. So we're here today. We're here today united to respond to the UN Secretary General's call um, for concrete responses to address gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. And 146 governments have already answered that call. Collectively, we're seeking to really advance two important goals. And these goals really will unite our efforts 
first to um, drive forward an acceleration of concrete policy responses, and second to promote zero tolerance of gender-based violence across all spheres of society everywhere. Our strategy for change is based on four key levers. These levers of action to address gender-based violence right now in COVID-19. These levers are to prevent, to fund, to respond, and to collect, collect data. As you'll see in the coming video, many governments have taken very concrete measures to prevent gender-based violence by integrating measures into COVID-19 response and recovery plans to really fund and drive funding into civil society organizations, into essential services, to respond to growing gender-based violence reports by strengthening services, by supporting women survivors of violence, and to collect data, putting data at the heart of everything we do so that we understand the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls. Let's take a look at that video right now. We know lockdowns and quarantines are essential to suppressing COVID-19, but they can trap women with abusive partners. I appealed for an end to violence everywhere now. Fantastic. I hope that you can see that already in the context of this pandemic, policy measures and responses that are innovative are driving change, whether that's the adaptation of services through the use of technology, whether that's the strengthening of multi-stakeholder partnerships, or whether that's driving essential services as central to COVID-19 policy responses. In today's conversation, we're going to highlight and discuss these concrete examples. We're going to look at some of the practices across different players in terms of policies, in terms of funding mechanisms, in terms of measures. As we kick off this conversation, let's start by hearing from one of the UN Trust Fund's grantees on ending violence against women. Uh, this grantee is from Cameroon, Ms. Nora Nagwa who will join her voice to our call together for a world free from violence and a world where women's organizations are empowered and supported. Over to this short video from our UN Trust Fund grantee. We, the women's rights organizations, ask the United Nations member states to support our work and organization during COVID-19 crisis by acknowledging that investing in women's rights organizations means leaving no woman or girl behind. We are first responders even in conflict situations, standing at the forefront, supporting women and girls facing complex challenges during COVID-19 confinement in conflict with extreme forms of violence, contributing to the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goal 5 on gender equality. Thank you so much to Nora and um, to all the grantees who are part of uh, this important response. 
Now I'd like to jump into our panel itself. And I'd like to invite the first panelist, Ms. Rajmi Singh. Ms. Uh, Rashmi is, Singh is the program director of the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care in India. Um, the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care is another UN Trust Fund grantee. And we'd love to hear, Ms. Singh, your perspective as a civil society activist, as a civil society organization dedicated to addressing gender-based violence. We know from the data that uh, and the increasing data that ending gender-based violence actually is possible, that ending gender-based violence is preventable. And we know that effective interventions can actually reduce intimate partner violence by up to 50%. We'd love to hear from you, Ms. Singh, from your experience, what are the challenges that civil society organizations are facing in your prevention work in the context of COVID-19? And what are the sorts of innovative approaches that have emerged to adapt prevention programming in this new context of the pandemic, especially in relation to physical distancing or to lockdown measures. Over to you, Ms. Singh. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'm, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, okay. Thanks, Sarah. And it's my pleasure to be here. And without uh, spending much time on uh, where I'm coming from, uh, we are based in India. And we have been into providing support services to women survivors. And now we are also working with individuals who identify themselves as non-binary. Uh, and we have been providing for the last two decades a different kind of support services, which ranges from a 24 hours hotline to a shelter to working with young people. Uh, so we, our model is like from a victim to a survivor to a thriver. Um, now, uh, coming back to... Uh, what this pandemic has meant for an organization like ours. Uh, and actually, I I'll just start with like the journey of the last six months. And then I think I'll come back to your question that what this whole preventive work means. Um, when the pandemic hit immediately in India also, like other countries on 26th March, a uh, complete lockdown was uh, announced. And uh, what as an organization we geared up to that, okay, there's going to be lockdown, women are going to be in the house, and so there will be increased violence. And we started hearing stories also. And after one week, I remember exactly when we internally reviewed that the number of calls which were coming on our hotline, and we saw that they have dropped down from 15 to 20 calls, which were coming in a day on a normal situation, they dropped down to one or two calls. And we were like, phew, what's happening? And like, Violence has increased, but the calls have dropped. And then when we took a stock of the situation, we realized one is that the government, when they announced that the essential services will be available, it was nowhere clear in that list that even these services would remain open. So for women, it was very hard to know whether an NGO is working, whether a hotline is working or a helpline is working. That was number one. The other was also that with the with if you are in home, with all the fam family members, with the abuser also, you are stuck in the house. We realized that actually it, women had very less space to even make those phone calls. And even so what we did immediately, what we did was a couple of things. One was that we immediately went out and publicized our uh, uh, hotline. And we really did that in Manifold, what we normally do much more than that. The other was that since PCVC has been working for the past two decades with the women survivors, we reached out to all of them almost because we had their call, because we knew that they have a history of violence and the chances of they getting back into and uh, under this stressful situation of an economic downfall also were very high. The third was because we also work with the, with the burn survivors, the hospitals had stopped taking women and a lot of burn wards were converted into COVID wards. So we reached out to the hospital to give us at least the data of the individuals. So I think these, and then what we did was we equipped our shelter home with separate isolation and quarantine places. We vacated our office, the team started working from house, from their homes. And we said, oh, then we arranged with our stakeholders that who would do, you know, at a very minimal rate, the COVID-19 test, because it was very important that also the safety of other uh, residents in the shelter was important. 
so we we equipped ourselves and and we as we publicized we saw that the that there was 400 calls on a day and there were like 500 calls when we started filtering the calls we realized that actually there were around 50% calls which were coming for all other humanitarian support because there was a helpline number available people asking for grocery but of course there were around 40 to 50% call which were so we set up like a two tiered structure where we had volunteers who were filtering the calls and only the dv calls were coming to the to, to the crisis counselors so that was one um so when when we did all of that we also realized that yes women were started coming they were asking for support in the for the shelter but what we have realized the pattern which we saw that the number of calls increased by almost like you know 10 times uh, but uh, and they were all crisis calls but when it came to they coming or opting for to stepping down they had lot of apprehension because they were not sure whether the whether that they'll be moving into a safe place when it comes to pandemic and also i think one of the things which happened was also that um um we developed like you know code words for chats because women were more open to like you know uh, talking on chat instead of a phone call and i think these were some of the things uh, which which we really had to gear up to align ourselves to the pandemic now coming back to the question that when it when we say that what it means to the prevention work i think our years of work and especially a pandemic like this what we have learned sara uh, and my other colleagues on the panel is that prevention for us has also meant that preventing women from re entering into that cycle of violence preventing women from being able to keep a silence around when they are violent. so i think prevention has come up with a little bit of a nuanced understanding also um the other i think important part uh, has been that uh, for years we have been working on when we say prevention then we say working on mindset attitudes and belief and working on some of those root causes of of violence but actually when we have been doing this work for years what has happened is when you go out in the community and when you make people aware and they become aware what is violence what impact it has immediately cases start coming i think so and then the system has to be geared up to basically to align itself to to be able to actually provide support services so i think this is what this this pandemic has thrown up a new learning for us and coming back to i think what were some of the enablers uh, during this time so that we were able to quickly align uh, to do this entire support services and preventive work was i think uh, the flexibility at the level of the donor and i think that wouldn't yeah. have been possible and to name very openly the un trust fund and immediately the the trust team got back to us they asked us what's happening on ground and we realigned and repurposed the resources great uh, so i think that was something which was uh, i mean i'm putting all of this together i can go on and on but i think this this is this is what i can quickly <laughs> put together thank you so much rashmi and especially thank you for making this direct connection between the reports on violence and the ways in which the innovative approaches by civil society were so critical in terms of adaptations to your prevention programming and connecting that to the unique context of covid-19 and to the substantive changes you saw as a result thank you for sharing that experience with us I'd like now to invite our second panelist, Baroness Liz Sugg, who is the United Kingdom's Foreign Affairs and Development Minister, really to share with us the UK's experience in funding but also in supporting prevention and response to gender-based violence. Baroness, we're super honored and excited to have you with us today. And certainly prior to the pandemic, work to prevent and respond to violence against women and girls. and to support civil society organizations working in this field has been um an area of focus but also one that hasn't garnered sufficient funding across multiple stakeholders covid-19 probably has exposed even further chronic challenges in the field of tackling violence against women and in addressing some of the increased reports to violence against women and girls um as this presents new challenges to the efforts of both governments and civil society around the world 
Uh, Baroness, we'd love to understand, as the UK, such an important advocate, an important stakeholder in the prevention and response to gender-based violence, what opportunities do you see? Do you see to support civil society organizations, as well as to fund efforts to really prevent and respond to violence against women and girls? Efforts that will prevent and avoid the rollback on progress made, and perhaps efforts that can facilitate new commitments to progress, including in the context of humanitarian conflict and fragile contexts. Over to you, Baroness, for your thoughts. Thanks, Sarah, and it's great to be joining you all today for such a um, As we say, prior to the pandemic, uh, those working to help prevent and respond to gender-based violence were already underfunded, and COVID-19 made that situation the, the hard-won progress. Support civil society organizations and we need to drive forward new commitments in this area. So one of the real opportunities we have is the new generation equality action coalition on GBV, which I'm really pleased to see is co-leading with some fantastic And the coalition, as he said, really lies in it being a, a multi-stakeholder partnership working together to deliver these concrete, really game-changing results over the next five years. And the statement being presented today reflects the we have when we work together is this specific good. Um, the important thing I think to remember is that violence is preventable through the UK's What Works to Prevent Violence program. We showed that uh, our programs were able to reduce violence by up to 50%. And I think we all need to collectively challenge ourselves to do more and to fund more. I'm really proud that the UK is investing over £67 million to systematically scale up our proven violence prevention efforts. And that's the largest investment um, from any donor government to prevent this kind of violence. Um, but as we've heard, the challenge is more urgent than ever in the context of COVID-19. Uh, we've already provided additional funding to UNFPA and UNICEF to protect vital SRHR services and really help scale up the protection and support services for women and girls. And supporting the multilateral system is incredibly important, you know, so we can deliver at scale. But we know, and we've heard today, that women's rights organisations and local GBV actors are the frontline responders on the ground. And despite the critical role these people play, you know, these organisations are terribly underfunded. In 1617, only 1% 1 of all gender focus aid went to women's organisations. And COVID has really further highlighted this problem. And that needs to change. I'm really delighted to announce today that the UK is providing additional funding to the Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. As Gonzili said earlier, this COVID-19 crisis response window is designed to specifically support you know, small and women-led civil society organisations and really deliver real change on the ground. And we know this can be tough, even dangerous work, and that you know, really requires support. So, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic really risks reversing our hard-won gains. We as the Generation Equality Forum really must stand together and try to resist any rollback. And fighting for gender equality is, is the right thing to do and in the interest of all of us. And we need greater leadership, greater investment and greater accountability and really get survivors at the centre of our approach. So we know we can prevent DBV. This Action Coalition and the statement we made today will be a major step towards that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baroness, um, particularly for uh, not only articulating the UK's deep and substantive commitment to being part of the leadership of the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence, but also the ways in which your commitment to driving change in practical and tactical ways to addressing the prevention and response to gender-based violence in COVID-19 is materialized. Um, thank you for guiding us through this uh, crucial topic of how funding as well as um, supporting civil society um, within the specific context of COVID-19 is indeed catalytic. Um, and for drawing our attention to um, really focusing on a survivor-centered approach, I think were your words, Baroness, um, and uh, how important that is to, um, to all parts of these levers of, of change, whether it's fund, prevent, respond, or collecting data. Building a survivor-centered approach is so critical. We are indeed in this paradoxical situation where we're going through one of the deepest crises 
um, that we've known for, for some time, probably since World War II, and where um, our economic situation is in um, absolute uh, dire straits. And indeed, the, the need to protect women's rights um, has never been so high. And the situation calls for collaboration, for synergies, for creativity, to leverage and mobilize efforts around the world. Um, our third panelist is Ms. Céline Bonner. Um, Céline is going to highlight the necessary collaboration that is required when it comes to funding responses to gender-based violence and to driving forward innovative approaches in the context of COVID-19. Um, Madame Bonner is the executive director of the Caring Foundation, which supports local survivor-centered organizations that provide comprehensive services to women, that works with women and with young men and boys on prevention programs. Ms. Bonner, we'd love to hear from you about how philanthropies like the Caring Foundation can really facilitate change by governments, by civil society, by the private sector and others to leverage and scale up progress and good practice on addressing gender-based violence. Over to you for your thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. I am honored to be part of this high-level panel and want to warmly thank uh, UN Women for the invitation. Um, just a few words about the Caring Foundation. So it's a corporate foundation, which means that we receive the funding directly from the Caring Group, which is a global luxury company with several brands and 38,000 employees worldwide. And as you said, we work hand in hand with local partner NGOs. So we really position between these two worlds, the private sector and the nonprofit sector. And the Caring Foundation has been involved in uh, combating violence against women uh, since 2008. Um, so we indeed have a threefold program supporting local survivor centered organizations, as you said, working on prevention program, engaging the youth and in particular young men and boys. But we also act to bring other companies on board and get engaged in this combat. So alongside the actions uh, that were taken by the states and the civil society in these times of COVID, uh, we made quick decisions to best support our partner NGOs and in particular regarding domestic violence, which, as it was mentioned, was the pandemic within the, the pandemic. So we had two parallel priorities. On one hand, uh, we publicized about the available resources for survivors, as Mrs. Singh uh, mentioned it. And we engage our wider networks to increase support. So we informed our employees about the resources and services for themselves or their families. Uh, end of March with a campaign called You Are Not Alone. And we were communicating the numbers and new hours of helplines, but also the available chats or the other online support groups on WhatsApp, for instance. And uh, we mobilized other companies and our brands uh, to raise funds to respond to violence against women. So first, uh, we engage other companies which are part of the One in Three Women uh, network that we co-founded three years ago with eight companies to raise awareness for the National Domestic Violence Hotline in France. Uh, run by Solidarité Femmes, uh, so to raise the awareness, but also to raise funds during and after lockdown. And the uh, funding raised uh, for, by seven times during that time. Um, the Caring Foundation also joined forces uh, with Gucci, one of the, the, the group brands, and Chime for Change uh, to raise funds for grassroots organizations and women's funds. And the second stream uh, of work was listening to our partners' needs and answering with reactivity. So we allocated funds uh, immediately to specialist organizations uh, in the six countries where we operate. It was unrestricted funding. We also provided resources through fundraising for the longer term so that the organization can cope with the situation because they had a loss of resources, had to shift to digital, etc. And uh, we customized also our own support uh, to this new reality. We extended the project period, were flexible on reporting, reallocation of some progress, 
programs according uh, new priorities, etc. So to conclude, um, what we learned and what we did during that time uh, as uh, an active and complementary role, of course, to what the government and the civil society did uh, was to capitalize on our close relationships with our partners to provide them with a tailored support, flexible, unrestricted funding is a powerful tool in time of emergency, innovative, we supported them with the development of digital resources, and we also built capacities for the organization to get more digital and sustainable, strengthening the long-term partnership, as it was mentioned before, and mobilizing other private donors uh, for sustainable resources. Thank you so much. Um, this aspect of creating the conditions for catalytic financing into uh, the hands of civil society organizations, as well as taking a listening posture um, to hear what the needs are of civil society organizations who are responding to the context of increasing reports of domestic violence is incredibly inspiring. Um, and the ways in which um, you've brought a very intentional lens of engaging men and boys and addressing masculinities into this work as the Caring Foundation is, is likewise inspiring as one of the innovative approaches to tackling gender-based violence um, now in the context of this pandemic. Thank you so much, Madame Bonaire. I'd love now to um, turn and give the floor to uh, another important player in the UN system. And this is to Ms. Diane Keita. She is the UN Assistant Secretary General and Deputy Executive Director of UNFPA. Um, here, we'd love to hear from you, Ms. Keita, um, really on uh, the ways in which we know that COVID-19 has created increased challenges for government and civil society related particularly to the collection of data on violence against women and girls. And despite this, data collection remains critical to evidence-informed policy, to the type of programming that we've heard already this morning. Um, could you share with us, Ms. Keita, what is, um, why, excuse me, is data so important to the response to COVID-19 and longer-term recovery plans? And why are multi-stakeholder partnerships and collective action so critical to combating gender-based violence in the context of this pandemic. Over to you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. And thank you for you and women for organizing such a beautiful panel. Um, Madam Baroness Sag, your excellencies, dear co-panelists, ladies and gentlemen, these are very, very important questions. And to start with the COVID-19 pandemic, for the first time in recent memory, forced all leadership at national and international level to converge to varying degrees around one common challenge. It was clear very early that the response to the pandemic and the attendant consequence, including shadow pandemic of gender-based violence, because it's a pandemic, would have to be evidence-driven. Therefore, gender-based violence is notoriously underreported because of multiple barriers, but data is absolutely critical to inform the evidence-based policy and programming and provide real-time information to responder, and that can save lives. Data and evidence form the backbone of global and national response to COVID-19 in general and gender-based violence in particular. UNFPA is proud to support the UN system and national partner in their effort to broaden data, evidence, and knowledge generation and sharing. This has included teasing out evidence from gender-based national helplines, online applications, community and institutional survey, as well as national research. The overarching aim of these interventions has not been merely to prevent and respond to GPV, but has included guiding the necessary policy and program intervention that will enhance gender equality and address the range of inequality at the national level that hinder optimal socioeconomic development. Therefore, 
UNFPA continues to support the integration of strategic evidence and data into national attempts at economic recovery and government efforts to build back better towards a world with no place for gender-based violence. Delivering this desirable new normal is a call for collective action, ladies and gentlemen, for high impact partnership that leverage the comparative advantage of various stakeholders in building more equitable and sustainable societies. It is heartwarming to see that member states, international organization, private sector, regional institution, civil society, community, and faith-based organization are all at the forefront of this action. We see the result of various collective efforts of, UN, of which UNFPA is a principal actor, such as the Spotlight Initiative and Joint Programming on Ending Child Marriage and Female Genital Mutilation, and so many more. The power of collective action is unique. UNFPA is committed to achieving zero gender-based violence and zero harmful practices by 2030 through our work in 150 countries, including all the 56 in humanitarian context. In doing so, we are so grateful to all our donors and partners. As part of the collective effort across the UN system, we put special focus on the work with those mo the most at risk of violence, such as women and girls with disabilities, people on the move, LGBT LGBTQI and women from minority group. Together with the government, we have been supporting efforts to have sexual and reproductive health and measure to address gender-based violence embedded in health system to ensure sustainable recovery plan. There is no doubt, joint effort and investment in gender equality and ending violence can make a transformative difference in the lives of women and girls and help to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to act as one together in a coherent and evidence-driven manner. I thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Executive Director Keita from UNFPA, particularly for highlighting the importance of evidence-based policy responses, the importance of putting data um, that is survivor-centered, that is safe into the, into the heart of the gender-based violence prevention and response um, in the context of COVID-19, and indeed for highlighting the importance of multi-stakeholder and collective action uh, and the importance of partnership. Partnerships such as Spotlight are so catalytic and crucial at this time. I would love, as we've been speaking so concretely about aspects of funding, um, aspects of prevention, of data collection to now hone into response, to look at this area of response from um, the purview of the ways in which explicit measures are needed so that survivors of gender-based violence are able to access services that are maintained as essential during COVID-19 lockdowns. And that these, these services are also continued um, across um, all aspects of opportunity through all stakeholders. And here I'm delighted to share that we have with us today, Ms. Cecilia Chacon Castillo, the Minister for Human Rights of Ecuador. Minister Chacon, as you know, across the world, service providers and civil society organizations have recorded increased reports of violence against women and girls in the context of COVID-19. And certainly the Secretary General's call to peace in the home has urged governments to retain services as essential ones, particularly for those uh, women and girls who are experiencing violence. We would welcome the opportunity to hear about the measures that the government of Ecuador has put in place to ensure that women and girls are protected, that they can access comprehensive gender-based violence services, including, for example, access to justice. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much. 
Euh, non, j'ai pas eu de problème. J'étais à la demi, j'ai repris. Mais I, I, I apologize for interrupting you, dear minister. May I invite you to turn off your direct interpretation um, uh, uh, line so that we can just hear your voice directly and the interpreters will do their good job. So if you go to interpretation and turn it to off, um, that will help us hear you clearly. Apologies for the interruption and back over to you, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to share with committed women. Um, e eh, greetings from Ecuador in America Latina. I am speak Spanish, uh, I will speak Spanish in my mother tongue. Bueno, el Estado ecuatoriano a través de esta secretaría desde el 16 de marzo empieza una estrategia con varios ejes. Un eje que tiene que ver con la comunicación específicamente, otro que tiene que ver con la atención durante pandemia COVID-19 y otro que también desde el Estado planifique una visión de protección a niñas, niños y mujeres en situación de violencia de basada en género y intrafamiliar. Por ello es que planificamos y aperturamos un espacio que permita contar con un protocolo de comunicación a fin de que no se interrumpan los procesos de atención a mujeres durante COVID, como una campaña nacional de promoción de auxilio con el 911 y mediante el teléfono 1-800 delito. Hay que posicionar en la ciudadanía la posibilidad de ejercer el derecho pleno de las mujeres a recibir atención aún en situación de confinamiento y sobre todo aquellas mujeres que están en mayor situación de riesgo. Muchos deben saber que el Ecuador tiene una parte rural donde los servicios no llegan inmediatamente. Por eso es necesario que durante esta emergencia sanitaria hayamos tenido que activar el Mujer Ecuador te acompaña a fin de motivar un empoderamiento de las mujeres. Porque a pesar de la difusión que existe a nivel mundial y en el Ecuador, muchas mujeres aún no se atreven a soltar el silencio, a decir basta y sigue siendo un problema muchas veces de las mujeres con ellas mismas, es decir, no funciona tampoco la red familiar y es por eso que también hemos motivado permanentemente que la red familiar sea uno de, las, de los motivos por los cuales las mujeres también conversen y hablen de esta situación. El Estado ecuatoriano impulsa también entonces este protocolo que articula a varias instituciones del sistema de justicia, de la Policía Nacional, del sistema de salud, del sistema de derechos humanos y de los gobiernos locales, entre otros, para una respuesta emergente, especialmente en la judi función judicial, y evitemos que muchos de, los, de las violencias que tenemos las mujeres prescriban escriban por, eh, por el confinamiento y debido a COVID-19. Esto ha implicado también para el Ecuador un reto fundamental que implica sobre todo avanzar en los medios telemáticos. Hoy por hoy la tecnología es uno de los desafíos que se vuelve en el mundo y para Ecuador la máxima prioridad para articular los servicios de atención en todas las áreas y también incluye la atención por violencia basada en género. Durante el estado de excepción, la Secretaría de Derechos Humanos mantuvo 45 servicios en todo el país. Y esto ha incluido atención psicológica, promoción social, orientación legal, a fin de que podamos atender más de 55 mil llamadas de auxilio. Y, y dentro de ese número de llamadas que se redujeron en pandemia, no significa que se redujo la violencia, sino que se redujeron las posibilidades de pedir auxilio. Y aún en esa condición, acompañamos más de un centenar de mujeres y sus hijos en transbordos donde teníamos que ir incluso de un país a otro para asegurar la vida de las violencias y más de 50 destinos internos en el país que significaron el traslado de las mujeres y sus hijos 
a fin de salir de la situación de riesgo en la que se encuentra. Los meses más difíciles para el Ecuador se transformaron en mayo y junio debido al alto número de violencias contra niños, niñas y mujeres, reportando también femicidios. Y en cuanto a la respuesta de esta Secretaría de Derechos Humanos, más de 15.810 víctimas entre marzo y agosto experimentaron un aporte del sistema de atención a través de esta red de servicios que podemos tener en el Ecuador. Sin duda, muchas de estas articulaciones de emergencias implican desafíos que también implicaron eh, el contagio de COVID a muchos de los servidores que estábamos atendiendo en la primera línea, médicos, enfermeras, el sistema de sanitario, pero también personas que están en los otros servicios, incluido el de justicia o en el mismo espacio de derechos humanos. Pero este espacio también eh, sirvió para compartir el esfuerzo de la sociedad civil y de las organizaciones a través de cinco casas de refugio y centros de protección, que son 16 en el Ecuador. Y se atendieron a más de 1.030 mujeres y sus hijos mensualmente que fueron reportadas, que llegaban a estos servicios para el acogimiento en todo el país. Aquí, también en el Ecuador, la Comisión Mixta dejó sin efecto los plazos de notificación de las medidas administrativas de protección inmediata que emiten las instancias de protección en el territorio a fin de que no prescribe el delito y se ratifiquen por el sistema de justicia para garantizar la protección de las víctimas. La Fiscalía General del Estado facilitó la denuncia web evitando el desplazamiento de víctimas hacia sus oficinas y la Defensoría del Pueblo facilitó canales telemáticos para el acompañamiento a víctimas en protección de casos. Thank you very much from Ecuador. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for this concrete example of how your government is leveraging institutional efforts to ensure that women not only have access to essential services, but also access to justice and are protectors, protected, excuse me, as survivors of violence. You provided um, some important contextual and clear pragmatic exemplars I'd like to now build on that as we look at the response to gender-based violence by inviting Ms. Rachel Shibesh, who is the Chief Administrative Secretary in the Ministry of Public Services and Gender of Kenya. Um, Ms. Shibesh, uh, we know that civil society organizations also indicate not only increased rises in gender-based violence, but also increased complexity of gender-based violence, including harmful practices, such as female genital mutilation, as well as child marriages. Mm -hmm. Drawing on the experience of the government of Kenya, what are some of the promising practices and policy responses that your government is taking to address this increased complexity of harmful practices in the context of COVID-19. Over to you, Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, let me say that I am representing my cabinet secretary. I'm the Deputy Minister. And uh, I'm uh, delighted to be here today to share with you our experience during the COVID period on especially FGM as one of the harmful practices. Not to say that GBV has not increased during the time of COVID, it has. Uh, teenage pregnancies as well have increased, but the shoot or the spike was in female genital mutilation. And that made us, you know, wake up and, and, and know that there is going to be a crisis. And the crisis will, will involve increased numbers of FGM and what we've come to know as new ways and methods in which um, FGM is being treated at this time of COVID. So with the support of the UNFPA, who are our biggest partners on FGM, we as a ministry started an accelerated uh, intervention on FGM since COVID. The reason being that our law that is very robust and we are very proud of the fact that we are a country that has a very strong anti-FGM uh, law, but our law has become a Waterloo because the, then um, the, the practitioners of FGM have realized that now they can be arrested from the parents up to the, you know, to the cutters and even the community leaders. And what they have done is therefore found new ways to commit FGM 
that you know uh, start stepping the law. And therefore, when we did the accelerated response, our work was to go back and read the law. And literally, we are never in the office. We are at the grassroots where FGM is happening. We have 22 counties. Be, reason be that we feel that to be seen there as government also is a deterrent. We could work with civil society, we work with other organizations, but the moment a minister is seen, a principal secretary is seen, a company secretary is seen on the ground, and even the uh, leadership of the provincial administration, the one that goes up to the chief level, who obviously are government officials as well, we realize that that is the only way we are going to be able to also curb the new method. One of the new methods is FGM to infants between one month to three months, done by the local women, translated into aunties, the names are aunties or grandmas, and they use their fingernails. They use their fingernails to snip off these young babies, toddlers. And that was a totally new phenomena that we did not understand. And therefore we had to engage the hospitals and the nurses. Now, medicalization also grew in leaps and bounds in areas where they knew now they would be caught if they were in the, in the village. They went to hospitals and, and, and dispensaries and when FGM was going on. So again, we knew that we have to deal with the medical fraternity and with the county governments where the, the, the health facilities are under. And we've been able to, you know, have even some nurses license cancelled. And, you know, but most importantly was to tell them, you are also in this law as the medical fraternity. You are in this law on cross-border, which had also become big because, as I said, our law is very robust. We were able to have the president talk to all the leadership or the, the countries around us to come up with a strong way to deal with cross-border because that is the way our FGM is rising by other countries allowing it to happen in their areas. And so we have that also as a robust way that we, that we have uh, you know, recovered. But also to say that when COVID happened, um, shelters were closed as well as schools. And it was immediate to us that schools were shelters. Girls being in school, many schools would not even allow those girls to go home during the holidays, areas where there was intervention on FGM. Now, because of COVID, the schools were shut, shelters were shut, the girls were exposed again. Because of the, the ability for my cabinet secretary to sit within the COVID response task force of the country, those are issues that she was able to take there and therefore ask that some schools remain open because they translate to safe houses and shelters for these young girls. Really, I could go on and on, but what we have learned about COVID, especially around FGM, is that it opened up an opportunity for our gains, you know, to be almost eroded, especially on FGM and GBV, almost eroded. And that made us wake up and realize, do we always see other pandemics and crises in this manner that COVID has, which has opened up our eyes. And I've been saying, and my minister said, we have no excuses, we are government. We cannot say because COVID happened, then girls had to be cut. No, whether COVID happened, girls need to be protected. So our takeaway for even sharing on this platform is this, that COVID cannot be used as an excuse by government at all. COVID must be the way that government becomes more robust. Some of the legislation we're saying that we are walking around with never was concretely engaged with as of now. So let's use COVID to protect our girls further, to be able to come with better working mechanisms and to interact and have a multi-sector approach, especially with civil society, with which, without whom we would not be able to intervene the way we have done. Thank you very much. Honorable Deputy Minister from Kenya, thank you so much, um, both for raising our attention to the ways in which the interlocution of uh, the lockdown of schools and the increasing rise of FGM has led to a significant situation, but one which you framed also as an opportunity, one that the government has stood up and sought to address in such pragmatic and concrete ways. We so appreciate this guiding examples of practices and policy responses to really responding to harmful practices uh, in the context of COVID-19. And we'd like now to move, um, we've moved from, from Ecuador to Kenya, and now we're going to go virtually all the way to Fiji, um, to Fiji where it is actually three o'clock in the morning. 
And here I have the deep pleasure of, um, of welcoming the, uh, the Honorable Ms. Marisini Vuniwaka, who is the Minister of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation in, in Fiji. And here, Minister, um, Minister Vuniwaka, we are so grateful that you have stayed up into the wee hours of your morning, um, into the late hours of your night to share with us Fiji's experience and the work of your government to ensure that women and girls impacted by violence can still receive care and treatment now in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, Honorable Minister. Colleagues, in Fiji, as elsewhere, the impacts of COVID-19 are being disproportionately felt by women who earn less than men, have less saved, and work in jobs with little security or protections. These preconditions coupled with increased unpaid work from additional caring responsibilities at home and spikes in already high rates of gender-based violence. Global data confirms that since the outbreak of COVID-19, reports of violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence, has increased across the world. In Fiji, there's also been a significant increase in calls to the Domestic Violence National Helpline. The helpline recorded 87 calls in February before we got our first case of COVID-19, 187 calls in March, and 527 calls in April after COVID-19 hit. 54% of calls were domestic violence related while close to 50% of women are reporting a correlation between COVID-19 and an increase of violence linked directly to the restrictions of movement and economic strains on families. Government of Fiji's immediate response to COVID-19 and around the same time in April of this year, we were also hit by a tropical cyclone herald to ensure access to quality response for all women and girls and survivors included. I'll name a few um, initiatives around this area a COVID-19 response gender working group was formed. The working group was led by the Ministry of Women and includes representatives of civil society and women's rights organizations, as well as UN Women. The working group developed a guidance note and infographic knowledge sheets. Guidance note highlights the gendered impacts of COVID-19 in Fiji on selected sectors and important issues such as violence against women and girls with brief analysis and recommendations. Two agenda-based violence working group was also formed under the Fiji Safety and Protection Cluster to rapidly advance prevention and responses to violence against women and girls during emergencies. The working group, again, is led by the Ministry of Women, the Fiji Women's Crisis Center, a non-government organization, and UN Women, and works in partnership with frontline service providers the working group has rapidly developed information, education, and communication materials, such as resource kits and virtual trainings for frontline healthcare workers, community workers, and helpline, social welfare, and other frontline GBV responders during COVID-19. Three, a national GBV prevention communications campaign was developed during this time as well, starting with texting messages sent to all mobile phone users across the nation prevention and GBV services messages from national and community leaders to be shared through radio, television, and online during the 16 days campaign in November, as well as posters, stickers, and other materials. In addition, the Ministry of Women continued its efforts to lead the development and implementation of a five-year whole of government national action plan to prevent violence against women and girls. The, it's a whole of government inclusive evidence-based approach to prevent violence against all women and girls. Colleagues, during this process, we were reminded again that firstly, it is not only key to initiate the work rapidly in response to a crisis, but strategically, and most importantly, in coordination, collaboration, and partnership with all relevant stakeholders, in particular, women's rights and community-based organizations. Secondly, no single fixed solution or plan will erase the entrenched and often unconscious systems of gender bias in our societies. There must be many fixes tailored to the specific conditions that prevail in each country and each region. 
For Fiji, this involves looking beyond simply the gaps, but also addressing attitudes and social norms that structure the power relations between women and men. Attitudes and social norms that are embedded in gender inequality, gender discrimination, and patriarchy, and other drivers and root causes of violence against women and girls. I thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for highlighting these very practical, very, very impressive steps by the government of Fiji to not only bring together a gender-based violence response and prevention uh, organized working group, but also to advance such concrete measures as a national action plan over the coming five years. And indeed for drawing our attention to the criticality of a multi-stakeholder approach, to the criticality of civil society organizations in that approach, as well as to the importance of tackling on this, the uh, structural realities of uh, gender norms, of harmful gender norms. We appreciate so much, Minister, that you have taken the time to be with us, especially in this very late hour for you in Fiji. And with that, I'd like to now turn to our um, discussant for today, Ms. Joanna Maycock, who is the Secretary General of the European Women's Lobby. She will raise important points and provide a perspective of what you have heard from across all our panelists and hopefully drive additional discussion as well as a dialogue. Over to you, Ms. Maycock. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, and thanks to all the esteemed panelists who've gone before me. Um, this, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to address all of you today. Um, as a representative of more than 2,000 women's organizations in Europe, the European Women's Lobby knows, as all the other panelists have highlighted, that male violence against women and girls is an emergency situation which daily threatens women and girls' lives and human rights. That clearly precedes this pandemic crisis. Male violence against women is a structural historical phenomenon embedded in our patriarchal societies. It's the result, as the previous speaker said, of the social norms, stereotypes and inequality which all women and girls in the world are facing. There's not a single country where women and girls are free from male violence, and there's not a single area in any woman's life where she's not exposed to it or to the threat of it. All forms of male, viol male violence against women and girls have the same goal, to maintain men's dominance, domination and control over women and girls' lives and bodies, to silence women and to put women in subordinate place compared to men. And this crisis has served, as we've heard from all the speakers, to make even more obvious the need for us to step up our efforts, our collective efforts, in realizing the commitments already made by states to prevent and address the full continuum of male violence against women and girls. So the COVID crisis has deepened pre-existing inequalities um, and women are shouldering disproportionately the impact of this crisis with an increased risk of harm for all different forms of male violence. And we've heard from different speakers um, about intimate partner violence, as well as other forms of male violence, online abuse, sexual exploitation and prostitution, incest, rape, FGM. In Europe, what we've seen as a result of the crisis is a shocking increase of somewhere upwards of 30 and even as much as 50% increase in male violence against women and girls in the European Union. Uh, we've heard from other speakers um, the impact of lockdown situations, uh, being locked down with controlling and violent male family members. Women and girls have had to face even bigger obstacles to seek help and get the specialized support they need, especially women facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. And we've seen in Europe, and we know this is true across the world, that those specialized support services were already underfunded, were already in crisis, before, before COVID hit. So together with the members of the European Women's Lobby across Europe, we've been ringing the alarm bell for a quick and urgent reaction to the increase in male violence against women and girls since the beginning of the crisis and well before that for the last 30 years. Um, we've also stepped up efforts, for example, to call for the full implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Um, in Europe, what we've seen during the crisis is that some governments have reacted, putting in place innovative contingency measures, such as accessing support um, through pharmacies, which remained open even in the most extreme lockdown situations, or the provision of extra shelter spaces, for example, in hotels, which were no longer being um, used. 
um, and also uh, innovative prevention and information campaigns, some of which with the advice and support and certainly with the pressure from women's organizations. But it's too little and it's too late. And we must make sure that these new commitments are transformed into long-term properly resourced actions that we know work. It needs, uh, to use the previous speaker's words, a whole government and a whole society approach to really combat the scourge of violence against women and girls. That means that women's specialized services, shelters, health services, support services should be considered as essential services by all states at all levels. We've heard from all the speakers um, the need to massively scale up long-term funding to women's civil society organizations and women's specialized services at the front line. All speakers have mentioned it. We've known it that that's one thing that works. It's the key thing that works. Now is the time to make it a reality, including here in the European Union. Um, all responses to the short term and the long term to COVID crisis must ensure the voice of women and girls survivors of violence are included. And we must improve across the, throughout the world the collection and use of sex disaggregated data in designing and defining all of our response. So on the 25th anniversary of Beijing, it's time to pool all our resources to accelerate the fight to achieve the visionary goals set out by our sisters in Beijing with renewed urgency. It's a stark reality. If we don't want to lose the hard fought ground for the last 25 years, it's imperative that the short and long-term responses to COVID crisis place equality between women and men at their heart and ensure that women don't pay the price for this crisis. We must work together, as Ms. Cater said, in high impact partnerships. Collectively, we must step up the fight to ensure all women and girls in the world live a life free from male violence and the fear from violence. That's why we welcome the leadership of the UN Secretary General in a whole UN approach in this matter. And welcome the opportunity to take part as leaders in the Action Coalition addressing violence against women and girls to contribute and bring our voice to advance this ambitious essential agenda with more collective energy and resources. Um, as Minister Shebesh said, no more excuses, no more excuses. We have a historic opportunity and an imperative to act now, to be loud, to be united, to end male violence against women and girls. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maycock. You have provided, I think, such a phenomenal summary um, for us, as well as inspiring words about how important this opportunity is that lies before us now. And especially as we head towards the high level event on October the 1st, where we will look at 25 years on from Beijing, we hope to hear more concrete commitments and actions by member states and others represented at the highest level to address gender-based violence and to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. Thank you for these really phenomenal closing words. Um, as we close off this high level panel, and as we focus so concretely on pragmatic change, on pragmatic efforts, on solutions that work, we would like to share with you a video recorded by one of our Action Coalition leaders, the government of Uruguay, and some of the initiatives that the government of Uruguay has undertaken to address gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19. Let's hear about those. Uruguay se une a los 146 estados miembros que respondieron al llamado del Secretario General de las Naciones Unidas para que la prevención y reacción a la violencia de género se conviertan en una parte fundamental de la respuesta del COVID-19. Si bien nuestro país se enorgullece de su respuesta al coronavirus, basada principalmente en la libertad responsable, somos conscientes de que tenemos un gran desafío por delante. La pandemia trajo consigo un aumento exponencial de la, de la violencia de género y a ese flagelo también hay que combatirlo con voluntad, convicción y energía. Por esa razón es que implementamos protocolos, medidas de comunicación, apoyo psicológico, entre otras cosas, para responder a las necesidades y abordar las vulnerabilidades de las mujeres y niñas durante esta emergencia sanitaria. Instamos a todos los actores... En primer lugar, a reconocer la violencia de género como una emergencia mundial, abordándola con urgencia, voluntad política y disponiendo recursos y mecanismos necesarios para erradicarla. Y por otro lado, apoyar financieramente a las organizaciones dirigidas a promover los derechos de las mujeres y niñas, 
así como proteger a los defensores de los derechos humanos de la mujer y a los constructores de la paz en todas las etapas de respuesta y recuperación del COVID-19. Thank you so much to the government of Uruguay and indeed to each of our panelists from across the world, from civil society, from private sector, from philanthropy, as well as from governments. The experiences you have shared are concrete examples that increasing rates of gender-based violence can be addressed, that collective concerted action to tackle gender-based violence is possible, and that concrete action is now more than ever needed. Thank you so much for your participation. And now, Rula, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, and for all the panelists for such a fascinating discussion. I just want to remind everybody that sexual assault, rape, is basically a hate crime. And we can legislate and we can prevent it, but we have to tackle the issue as a cultural pandemic. And when we have world leaders today who talks about women in a misogynistic, sexist terms, when we have world leaders who are actually leaders of superpowers, who talks about grabbing women by their genitalia, or some leaders actually who are leading countries who talk about and threaten women of rape, like the president of Brazil and others. This sends actually a message to everyone, to an average citizenry, that it's an open season against girls and women. And when, so when women, most women who come forth and basically go to the police, they feel most of them that they're raped twice, once by the perpetrator and the second time by a society that is denying them justice. We're talking today about accountability, about justice, preventative measures, but the most important part is how we talk about women, how we address them, how we, let leaders understand and reject those leaders who talks about women in a demeaning, in a, in a sex, with a sexist, misogynistic language. That's a part that we need to talk about boldly and bravely. And now, as we transition to a second round table, I would like to invite you and invite representative from Mexico and from France as members of the Gore core group of the general of uh, the Generation Equality Forum to deliver a video message. Cher Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, cher Dr. Fumzile, cher membres, je suis très honorée de participer à cet événement aujourd'hui sur un sujet de la plus haute importance et qui me tient particulièrement à cœur depuis ma prise de fonction en tant que ministre chargée de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes de la diversité et de l'égalité des chances. Une des conséquences les plus dramatiques de la crise que nous connaissons est l'augmentation des violences sexuelles et sexistes. Nous l'avons observé en France comme dans de nombreux pays. Cette situation nous oblige à nous mobiliser collectivement pour obtenir des résultats concrets et pour assurer aux femmes et aux filles leur droit le plus fondamental à la sécurité. C'est pourquoi je souhaitais m'exprimer aujourd'hui lors de cet événement organisé par ONU Femmes pour réitérer l'engagement sans faille de la France à la fois sur notre territoire et dans notre politique étrangère féministe et pour soutenir le secrétaire général dans sa volonté de mettre cet enjeu en haut de son agenda. Comme certains d'entre vous le savent, l'égalité femmes-hommes et surtout la lutte contre les violences faites aux femmes est la grande cause nationale du quinquennat du président Emmanuel Macron. La France s'est particulièrement mobilisée pendant la pandémie en prenant des mesures innovantes et fortes pour s'adapter et prévenir les risques liés au confinement. Tout d'abord, nous avons renforcé les dispositifs d'alerte et d'écoute en direction des victimes. Tenant compte des difficultés pour se rendre en, physiquement au commissariat en période de confinement, nous avons renforcé nos lignes d'écoute, le signalement par SMS et les plateformes numériques. Un dispositif de signalement en pharmacie pour les femmes et leurs enfants victimes de violences a été également créé, comme des nouveaux points d'information dans les associations locales, les services de l'État ou les centres commerciaux. 
Des financements supplémentaires ont également été accordés pour permettre aux associations d'aide aux victimes de poursuivre leurs actions de première ligne si primordiales. Je note d'ailleurs avec satisfaction qu'ONU Femmes a reconnu la France comme l'un des pays qui a pris les mesures les plus ambitieuses pour lutter contre les violences durant cette période. Nous ne nous reposons évidemment pas sur ces lauriers et je sais aussi que ces efforts doivent continuer et être amplifié et nous sommes déterminés à continuer à agir en ce sens en temps de pandémie comme en temps normal. Notre engagement pour lutter contre les formes de violence faites aux femmes et aux filles se traduit également dans la politique étrangère féministe que mène la France. Depuis 2006, la France porte conjointement avec les Pays-Bas une résolution sur les violences faites aux femmes. Cette année, la résolution traitera en particulier de l'accès à la justice pour les femmes victimes et survivantes de violences. Nous cherchons le soutien de tous les États membres pour que le résultat soit à la hauteur de la situation actuelle. Cet engagement se concrétise également à travers notre plaidoyer en faveur de l'universalisation de la Convention d'Istanbul, qui reste un instrument primordial du droit international pour protéger les femmes. La France continuera d'être vigilante contre les tentatives d'instrumentalisation de la Convention par les forces conservatrices pour la promouvoir dans toutes les enceintes et pour appeler de nouveaux pays à l'adopter et à la ratifier. Je voulais finalement rappeler l'engagement du président de la République lors de la présidence française du G7 en 2019 d'un soutien financier à hauteur de plus de 6 millions d'euros en fonds mondial pour les survivantes de violences sexuelles liées au conflit, créées par le docteur Mukwege, euh, prix Nobel de la paix, et Nadia Mourad. Je salue par ailleurs à nouveau leur travail tout à fait remarquable. Enfin, la lutte contre les violences sexuelles et sexistes sera l'un des sujets incontournables du Forum Génération Égalité, organisé conjointement avec le Mexique et ONU Femmes au premier semestre 2021. Le forum, dont l'ADN est d'unir tous les acteurs de la société civile, les États, le secteur privé, les organisations internationales, est une opportunité d'obtenir des résultats inédits et extrêmement concrets pour faire reculer les violences. Une des six coalitions d'actions qui seront lancées à Paris portera spécifiquement sur les violences de genre. Vous avez entendu et vous entendrez encore les champions de cette coalition lors de l'événement d'aujourd'hui témoigner de notre volonté de travailler ensemble. C'est l'esprit du multilatéralisme dans les actes que porte le président Macron et la France continuera d'y prendre toute sa part, particulièrement dans cette lutte en faveur de l'égalité. Dear Fusile Mambon Juka, Executive Director of uh, UN Women, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to participate in this event. I want to commend Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his leadership and commitment to put at the center of his effort gender equality and to address violence against women as a priority in particular in these difficult times. 20 years ago in the Beijing Platform Act for Action, we established the goal to prevent all forms of violence against women and girls. Regrettable, we are far away from this objective. One of three women in the world have suffered a form of violence. Therefore, we must display all our efforts to avoid the more violent expression against women, which is feminicide. One of the most terrible impacts of the crisis of COVID-19 is on the safety and security of millions of women and girls, which situations has been aggravated. Confinement has put evidence in violence against women in particular in domestic violence during the pandemic. It is time to redouble efforts to address gender-based violence through dedicated political engagement and partnerships. Member states, civil society organizations, international organizations, and all the UN systems are called to act quickly and with effectiveness. In this regard, Mexico reiterates its strong support to appeal by Secretary General on gender-based violence and COVID-19 and the measures contained therein. The Mexican government has tackled the challenges posed by the pandemic with a focus in most vulnerable people through interinstitutional coordination, 
the mainstreaming of preventive intervention. As co-host with the government of France of the Generation Equality Forum, convened by the UN Women in partnership with civil society organizations, Mexico come together with the leaders of the coalition of, of, of violence against women of the forum in a joint statement in order to underline that gender-based violence is a women's and girls' human rights violation of pandemic proportions and as a global emergency must be fundamental concern for governments and institutions at all levels. All forms of gender-based violence are interconnected and have to be considered in the roots as an expression of structural inequalities of power. In this regard, as we did in Beijing, the Generation Equality Forum calls for urgent action and accountability for gender equality. The forum has at its heart the power of activism, feminist solidarity, and youth leadership to achieve transformative change. It's a collective and innovative partnership to achieve gender equality. All stakeholders and advocates will come together in a public conversation that in fact has already started. I'm sure that this dialogue will give us very valuable food uh, for thought to the Generation Equality Forum. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Moreno and Under Secretary Peraltra. The Generation Equality Forum is an energizing process for all gender equality advocates, and especially for youth around the world. And while today focus on gender-based violence and other action coalitions are being formed as part of the Generation Equality, I have the pleasure and the honor to invite Mr. Faiz King, UNICEF Deputy Executive Director of Field Results and Innovation to reflect on how the Action Coalition on Innovation and Technology also intends to play a role in addressing and preventing gender-based bi gender violence. Gender-based violence affects girls and women throughout their lives. It worsens in crisis situations. One aspect of GBV that is continuously growing is GBV that takes place online. But let us be clear, this is the same violence, just a different platform. Available prevalence rates state that 23 to 53% of girls and women face online GBV with some groups more at risk, young women and adolescent girls. GBV online takes many forms, threats, harassment, revenge, pornography, recruitment, including sexual trafficking, cyber stalking, live streaming of GBV, selling of girls and women, surveillance and tracking, and it has terrible consequences, including one, lifelong impact on girls and women's mental health and well-being. Two, a sense of safety, including offline, is affected. Three, the indefinite timeline of items posted online and the ability to propagate extremely rapidly. We are already acting to address this growing problem and must do more to one, mobilize the entire ecosystem of stakeholders, especially grassroots women and girls groups. For example, we are providing GBV response services with virtual options, such as UNICEF's virtual safe spaces for adolescents, girls in humanitarian contexts. Two, Mobilize tech solutions to support girls and women, including partnerships with leading tech companies and other private partners. For example, the gaming industry. UNICEF has worked with partners in Brazil using chatbots as a solution to online sexting experienced by girls. You will see more of this in a minute. Let me leave you by saying that UNICEF is delighted to be leading the Action Coalition on Innovations and Technology with numerous public, civil society, and private partners. Collectively, we are committed to come together on gender-based violence to make sure 
that we use everything we have to address this shadow pandemic. The exchange of intimate selfies on digital platforms, the so-called sexting, has become part of discovering sexuality among many adolescents and young people. But the practice is risky. The images can be shared without consent. As a result, victims, in most cases girls, have had to leave these schools or move to other cities. In order to provide young people with a safe space to learn and talk about the risks of sexting, UNICEF Brazil created the project Caritas. At the heart of the experience is Fabi Grossi, who's in big trouble. An intimate video of her went viral on the internet. She now needs to talk to someone. Fabi is embodied by an actress, but in reality, participants talk to a robot on Facebook Messenger. The project combines captivating storytelling with artificial intelligence, which allows the character to respond to participants' messages. The original goal of the project was to reach 70,000 users. With the support of Facebook Brazil, UNICEF implemented a segmented advertising campaign. Within a few weeks, the project organically went viral, involving almost 1 million adolescents and young people so far. To better understand participants' motivation and behavior, UNICEF organized two surveys among users. Based on the results, UNICEF is now working to create support and networks for victims of online gender-based violence, lessons learned and good practices. Closed online groups provide enormous potential for creating safe spaces where adolescents can discuss sensitive issues. Such digital projects can provide huge databases of contacts and important baseline information for follow-up activities. Testing is key, and both content and language need to be piloted with focus groups that represent target audiences. Results achieved. With Project Caritas, UNICEF Brazil was able to create a safe space where almost one million young people people received relevant and curated information about a sensitive issue they hardly had been able to discuss before. Thank you, Mr. King. As we know, social media platforms were meant to connect humanity. However, it can be also used in a malevolent way by many predators. Uh, a reminder that in countries, especially around the Middle East and Arab countries, there's many women that were, they killed themselves, they committed suicide because of porn revenge. Women in the United States, in Congress, were forced to resign, leave their offices and their jobs, basically, again, because of porn revenge and because of sexting. So social media platforms need to do more. We urge them to do to do much more to protect women and girls and interact with governments to find legislations to protect girls and women, not only in Western democracy, but in Africa and in the Arab world. And now it's time to move to our second high level round table, which focuses on the importance of partnerships, mobilization to address gender-based violence online and offline. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues. My name is Claudia Garcia Moreno and I lead the work of the World Health Organization on Violence Against Women. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second round table uh, on multi-stakeholder mobilization in addressing gender-based violence in a COVID-19 world. 
um, we have already had very substantive uh, inputs and we have heard about a lot of innovative and uh, promising solutions and underpinning all of these examples that we heard were important partnerships, uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships. We heard uh, from Fiji about partnership between government and civil society. We heard from Ms. Um, Bonaire about partnership between private sector and civil society. And we uh, know that central to all of our responses to addressing violence against women, both before, during, and after COVID are these partnerships, and in particular, the role of civil society. We are running very tight on time for this second um, round table. So without much more ado, I'm going to move uh, straight into our panelists. We have an equally impressive set of panelists who the, you have been introduced to already through the video representing stakeholders, including youth leadership, multilaterals, philanthropic organizations. And I'm going to move uh, straight into um, our first panelist. I would like to welcome Ms. Sara Al-Hilali, who is a Youth Affairs Council in the Youth Task Force for Asia Pacific. Um, she's representing the voices and experiences of girls, adolescents, and young women who we know are often the ones absent in discussions and in decision-making related to addressing uh, GBV. And COVID has highlighted the multiple and intersecting nature of inequalities that particularly young uh, women and girls um, are exposed to. And we would like to, um, Sarah, hear from you about what decision makers can do to ensure the full and meaningful leadership and participation of girls, adolescents, and young women in actions to address GBV how and to build back better after COVID and ensure that no one is left behind. Sarah, please. Thank you so much, Claudia. Before I begin, um, I acknowledge that I am speaking on the Indigenous land of Australia, whereby sovereignty was never ceded. As I stand in front of you all today, I speak as a young woman that has lived through gender-based violence, but has also witnessed decision makers within high levels fail us. I am tired. My sisters are tired. Claudia, you ask me what can decision makers do to ensure our youth leadership is meaningful. But firstly, let us abolish the notion that decision makers must implement the change that we need. If anything, I say young women and girls must challenge the power structure. We live within a world that has never, within history, truly benefited young women and girls. We cannot wait for decision makers to create the change that we have been making noise for, for centuries. They have ignored our pleas. They disregarded the tears that seep from our eyes. So what I say to decision makers is let us pave our paths for change. There was never a narrative that was the mythical, ensure that no one is left behind. Because collectively, we, the girls, the adolescents, the young women have been left behind in every part of time. The pandemic makes little difference. Let us make room and let us stop paving a road that will never be a true reflection of our stories and trauma. The discourse surrounding gender-based violence and the need for urgency will forever be condensed and saturated within decision-making. That is until we make the room to create the change that we need. We speak about gender equality and GBV as though that, that um, the, few, the few representatives are reputable within the eyes of the patriarchy that are deserving. But the truth is, is that gender equality is a table for all my sisters, regardless of our intersecting identities. The truth is, is that youth leadership is not a one size fits all solution. Claudia, you mentioned the rate of inequality has exacerbated dependent upon one's identity. So to me, 
This question seems a bit of a contradiction. This question portrays the notion that we, the young women and the girls are one body. However, we must discern the multiple barriers that largely affect the variety of intersectional identities that make up young women, adolescents and girls. Decision makers must invest in providing opportunities and financial support to my underrepresented sisters. We have recognized that the voices of indigenous young women, black young girls, transgender adolescents, just to name a few, are inherently attacked by society in utilizing their voice in the fight against GBV. But what baffles me is that the year 2020 has highlighted that there is no longer room for ignorance. So why are we continuing to, harm, to include these harmful habits of excluding some of the most underrepresented and vulnerable voices within the discourse of GBV? All I can say is that we must not stop fighting, not because we don't want to, but because our lives would be at risk if we did. It is time for decision makers to put their money where their mouths are, because the freedom of one will never equal the freedom of all. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Sarah, for so eloquently bringing not only the voices of young women, but also issues of diversity, the multiple levels of discrimination, be it because of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, other identities, and the importance not just of um, participation, but really genuine leadership and support and funding. So thank you very much for your eloquent words and uh, let's seek to build back better and inclusively. I'm going to move now to the next speaker, Mrs. Naledi Pander, who is the Honorable Minister for International Relations and Cooperation in South Africa. Ms. Pander was having challenges connecting, so I'm not sure that she is on. I'm here. Oh, um, wonderful, wonderful, I am, uh, um, Thank you. I, I am um, not uh, Naledi. I am Naledi's sister. <laughs> My name is Maite. Maite. We come Maite. from the second Maite is. Maite. Maite. Is Maite. Welcome very much to, to the panel. South Africa has been a strong leader in the area of gender equality and addressing gender-based violence. Um, but I'm going to ask you very specifically beyond um, what you've done nationally about the current role of South Africa as chair of the African Union. And to tell us a little bit about what role can regional bodies like the African Union play in mobilizing member states in the region to prevent and respond violence against women? Well, uh, we have time constraints. I wanted to say to you that I am a former minister, foreign minister. So I, from that experience, I know as a minister of women now, women, youth, and persons living with disabilities or that it, it can never, as the, the young lady was saying earlier on, say you will wait for somebody to do something for you, particularly this issue of gender-based violence. In South Africa, we say, and femicide, because COVID showed us that femicide is high and roaring, and it's hushed down all the time. Let me quickly answer your question. What can in this uh, um, coalition, a, so a country like South Africa that has fought apartheid first to liberate ourselves? Um, I was much younger than now. Now I'm youngish, like, like you. We 
a government can never be a government without the people. If it's a government that is democratic and has a following and leads people, it will have strong, sound civil society organizations who will work in partnership with governments. We are very fortunate in South Africa. We've got a president who is male, but every time we, we travel with him, not, not, not all the time because I'm no longer Minister of Foreign Affairs, but every time we travel with him on issues, gender, he would turn around and say, mate, women do not create these problems for themselves by themselves. They are created by men, men with low self-esteem, men who needs power and can't get, get, get it anywhere, but can only get it by hating, not other men, women. It comes from patriarchy. So in every society, be it in Europe or Africa, you will find patriarchy. It's hidden in different ways. It co-opts even some women into some corners as long as they can start working or showing like they're machoistic, then, then they're fine. Your question again, as your president, my president, is the chair of the African Union, what does he and other leaders, male and female do to do away to bury I say bury patriarch first, bury this gender-based violence and femicide with COVID. This is the undertaking that our president is saying we should do. That if we're talking about defeating COVID, we should do that with the same zeal Thing do away with gender-based violence and femicide. Femicide became much more spoken about in South Africa because of the lockdown. When people are locked up in a, in a space wherein they've got nowhere to go, and then they get done funny things by people who are supposed to be their uncles, their fathers, and so on, so on, and, and so on. So leaders of our continent have also made the undertaking that now, not tomorrow, it should be that indeed we do not separate uh, 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 calamities. We don't say, oh no, no, this is COVID, we will deal with it this way. This one, we know it's old, we've lived with it. Someone said since, a second World War. We are here um, at the UN now supposed to be celebrating the 25th year of the uh, Conference of Women or Beijing, but absolutely nothing or very little is changing because we don't talk of prevention, whether it is in Africa, but specifically, yes. Africa, our continent, where you, you because you, you, you asked me to refer to that, Pre come up with tools. What tools do we, do, do, we, do we come up with that which would make women feel protected, loved, and not abused? Tool number one is be preventative. Being preventative, it's leaving no space for would-be perpetrators uh, in, in the space where girls 
women should feel that that's their home too and that they should be protected. Thank you very much, Minister, for those words. Um, you've touched on very many things. Um, uh, you've touched on the issue of power inequalities and patriarchy, uh, and also very importantly about how patriarchy affects uh, not just men and boys, but also women and girls. Um, and you also highlighted prevention and at the heart of prevention, as we know, is transforming. Uh, gender norms, uh, the, all the various forms of discrimination that we were talking about earlier. So I'm sure we will come back to this issue of prevention and, and gender norms in some of the other, uh, with some of the other panelists. Thank you also for highlighting the issue of femicide. Um, it is indeed a, uh, an indictment of our society that femicide is as prevalent as, is, as it is. And we know that between 38 and up to 50% of the murders of women are carried by, um, out by intimate partners or, or close family members. So this is indeed an issue that, that needs a, attention. And finally, I think importantly, you flagged the sort of silver lining, if I can call it that, of, of COVID that we need, it, it, it has brought uh, unprecedented attention to the issue of gender-based violence. And we need to really uh, build these, um, these multi-stakeholder partnerships to ensure that we use this opportunity to the maximum. Thank you then. And we are moving now to Minister Asa Lindagen. Minister for Gender Equality in Sweden, also with responsibility for anti-discrimination and anti-segregation. Sweden has been a champion of gender equality for many years, um, not just uh, nationally, but also internationally. And so I wanted to ask you, Minister, what do you see as the potential for uh, multilateralism to facilitate political engagement and the acceleration of efforts to address violence against women and girls in the context of COVID-19? And what lessons can we draw from Sweden's uh, feminist foreign policy to address gender inequality? Thank you so much, Excellencies, distinguished uh, delegates, ladies and, and gentlemen, thank you for uh, this question. And I, I would like to start by saying that I'm honored to be uh, a part of this meeting and also a special thanks to Ms. Uh, Sara Al Hilali for a very uh, strong speech. Uh, I believe you touched the hearts of all of us. Um, I'm also very happy to see my colleague Minus Nkona uh, Mashabane again. Um, uh, so thank you so much for letting me be a part of this uh, meeting. Uh, to start with, uh, men's violence uh, against women is one of the ultimate expressions of inequality between women and men. Everyone must be able to uh, fully enjoy all human rights, irrespective of sex, gender, identity or expression, ethnicity, religion or other belief, disability, sexual orientation or age. Uh, as has already been raised today, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has bluntly been hitting already discriminated and marginalized groups uh, the hardest. And it is clear that the burden of the crisis um, is likely to hit women and men differently. Uh, a concrete example from a global context uh, is that men's violence against women and girls uh, has been increasing. Uh, and in fighting this pandemic within the pandemic, we need to stand strong and united. Uh, governments, civil society organizations, multilateral organizations, as well as other actors. Um, as regards to Sweden, my feminist government has on a national level taken uh, a wide range of actions. Uh, for example, we have allocated additional resources to civil society organizations uh, that work with children uh, in vulnerable situations as well as women, uh, children and LGBTI persons exposed to violence, including honor-related 
violence and oppression. And following the COVID-19 outbreak, the civil society organizations uh, may have a need to expand and develop their operations. For instance, to enlarge their presence on the internet uh, in order to reach out uh, to victims of violence. Furthermore, uh, the Swedish government has assigned to the Swedish Gender Equality Agency to identify and develop um, uh, efficient methods on how to reach out to victims of violence with information on how to get help and support in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, I would also like to mention that earlier this summer, the Swedish government appointed um, a committee to evaluate the measures taken by the government and public authorities to limit the spread of COVID-19. And the committee will also analyze and describe uh, the consequences of these measures on gender equality, including men's violence uh, against women and unrelated violence and oppression. Uh, Sweden uh, wants to pursue strong leadership on gender equality issues on a global level, together with four uh, other countries and a number, number of civil society and multilateral organizations. Sweden uh, is co-leading an action coalition on uh, economic gender equality in the frame of the Generation Equality Campaign. And for my government, uh, it is a top priority that women and men have the same opportunities and conditions as regards paid work, which gives economic independence throughout life. And there is uh, an obvious link between men's, women, uh, men's violence against women and economic aspects. Uh, for example, the importance of financial independence so that women are able to leave a violent relationship. And during the pandemic, it has become even more clear that many women have a weaker position uh, on the labor market due to precarious work and therefore are economically more dependent on their partner. Um, it is also clear to me that we need a strong welfare state that includes gender transformative economic reforms when we now with joint forces build back better in response of the COVID-19 pandemic. So to conclude, let us never, uh, not even for a millisecond, uh, forget that human rights are universal and apply to all, everywhere. Women and girls must always be ensured an adequate, uh, adequate standard of living, uh, access uh, to decent work, education and health, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, and a life free of violence and discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for uh, reminding us about the important links between economic um, independence and violence against women and the importance of gender equality, including in uh, economic terms, as an underpinning um, measure to address violence against women. And last but not least, of course, um, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. I'm going to turn now to Ms. Christina Galak, who is the State Secretary for Foreign Affairs and for Iberoamerica and the Caribbean of Spain. Um, Spain, again, similar to Sweden, has been engaged in preventing and responding to violence against women at national and international levels. You have a very important law in your country that has been very instrumental in, in supporting work um, nationally. And again, similarly, I wanted to ask you what role do you uh, see multi-stakeholder partnerships and initiatives playing um, in strengthening um, the measures to address gender-based violence, both nationally and internationally? Over to you, Ms. Kalak. Thank you very much, uh, dear moderator. Thank you very much, Claudia. Eh, si me permites, uh, voy a hablar en español. Entiendo que hay uh, traducción simultánea para todas las panelistas y las personas que nos siguen desde distintas partes del mundo. Ante todo, un profundo agradecimiento a ONU Mujeres y a todo el equipo que habéis trabajado para organizar este evento. Eh, que quiere mostrar el trabajo que está haciendo desde las Naciones Unidas, pero también desde los países y desde la sociedad civil 
como hemos escuchado testimonios muy importantes, eh, para erradicar la violencia contra las mujeres y las niñas, sobre todo en un momento en el que eh, se requiere más eh, eficacia, políticas más eficaces y respuestas colectivas. La pandemia, el COVID-19, ha tenido un efecto directo en la situación de las mujeres y las niñas y en concreto eh, estas han sido las que han sufrido un mayor índice de violencia. Eh, se ha hablado de la pandemia en la sombra, la violencia contra las mujeres y las niñas se ha hecho más insoportable. Por tanto, gracias por enfocar este tema y por la pregunta sobre cómo podemos trabajar más eficazmente con la sociedad civil. Permitidme un par de datos. Eh, primero, eh, según las distintas estadísticas el, y los registros que hay, se ha incrementado el 30% de violencia contra las mujeres durante el confinamiento. Ello tiene un precio muy alto. Yo creo que las futuras generaciones lo van a pagar. Y también os voy a decir un dato. En España, el teléfono de asesoramiento y de información jurídico al que las mujeres víctimas que se sienten víctimas de violencia llaman el 016, um, recibió durante los meses de la pandemia y del confinamiento el 40% más de llamadas. Por tanto, son síntomas claros y datos claros de que este problema se agudizó y que tenemos que darle solución. Y yo creo que eh, hay tres áreas de actuación muy importantes. Una es la prevención, reforzando los mecanismos de prevención y acceso a la información de, sobre los servicios y ahí la sociedad civil desempeña un papel muy importante. Segundo, que la información a la que se accede es fiable y que hay líneas de asistencia concretas, específicas, que uno llama y hay algo que ocurre. Y en tercer lugar, muy importante, lo que es el tema específico de este panel es reforzando la colaboración de los distintos niveles de gobierno con la sociedad civil, las organizaciones eh, que eh, durante eh, tanto tiempo han movilizado la causa de las mujeres, las niñas, por tanto, este es, una, es un aspecto muy importante. Dejadme comentar muy brevemente lo que España hizo durante el confinamiento y durante la pandemia, eh, cuando estábamos en la situación más crítica. Primero, se adoptaron medidas legislativas muy importantes. Segundo, un plan de contingencia que fue coordinado con todos los ministerios y los distintos niveles de la administración y además con la sociedad civil. Y eso quiero subrayarlo. Fue con la participación de lo que llamamos el Consejo de Participación de la Mujer. Y muy importante, este plan se amplió después a las víctimas de trata y de la explotación sexual. También fundamental si queremos luchar contra la violencia de género. Y por último, se hizo una gran campaña de comunicación. No era raro ver entre los eh, informativos más, de más audiencia cuñas informativas sobre eh, números de teléfono, sobre mensajes eh, que se daban a las posibles víctimas. Y en paralelo activamos nuestra acción eh, hacia el exterior con iniciativas que se presentaron tanto en la Asamblea General como a su vez en nuestro plan de cooperación al desarrollo que también le pusimos esta perspectiva de lucha eh, contra las desigualdades, incluida la violencia. Para terminar, porque ya creo que he consumido mis tres minutos, tres grandes o fundamentales mensajes. Primero, importante elaborar y ejecutar y hacer un buen seguimiento de las medidas 
que se toman de manera conjunta por las administraciones y las organizaciones civiles. Este trabajo es fundamental. Segundo, dotar de recursos. Recursos, además, de manera sostenible. España ha adoptado un plan de cinco años que está, eh, eh, son mil millones eh, de euros, lo que significa que los organismos que junto a las eh, administraciones públicas luchan contra la violencia tienen una financiación sostenida en el tiempo. Y en tercer lugar, muy importante, eh, recoger datos. Recoger datos para poder desagregar la información y poder actuar específicamente donde mayor problema hay. Por tanto, una respuesta holística pero concreta, una respuesta global pero específica y todo ello para proteger mejor a las mujeres y a las niñas y para luchar contra esta pandemia a la sombra. Que dirán moderadora, muchísimas gracias por el tiempo y uh, vamos a seguir con mucho interés el resto de presentaciones. Gracias. Muchas gracias, eh, señora ministra. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I think you have raised a lot of very important issues and uh, as I'm watching the The clock, I will try to be very brief, but I think you, uh, uh, I will highlight three things. One, the importance of working across all levels of government and having a coordinated response that is also coordinated and developed in partnership with civil society and women's organizations in particular. The second, I think very important point was about sustainable funding, that this is not just uh, Uh, responding to the immediate crisis, but also looking to the next uh, uh, to the next five years and ensuring that the funding is sustainable. Um, and uh, that lastly, uh, you highlighted the importance of collecting data and identifying the very uh, specific areas that may need particular attention and the importance of legal measures. So lots of food for thought there. Um, I'm, I will move uh, quickly to our uh, next panelist, who is Ms. Um, Gida Anani from ABAD, a Resource Center for Gender Equality. Um, ABAD has been a very important um, source of, of information and work in the, in the Arab region and very much engaged in many multi-stakeholder Uh, um, interventions, particularly around addressing harmful social norms. So I would like to ask Gita if you could share some good practices in engaging with men and boys during COVID-19 um, and some uh, um, of the prevention efforts that you're undertaking in the region. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for such an inspiring and stimulating, actually high level meeting. It has been quite, uh, uh, overwhelming in terms of learning and uh, lots of ideas that I think also as a society, we can pick on it and uh, transform it for best serving the, uh, the right holders. Needless to say that humanitarian emergencies, natural disasters and global pandemics put vulnerable groups, especially women and children at increased risk of violence, exploitation and abuse. And the current COVID-19 crisis is surely no exception. GBV continues to hold us back. It's time to come together around a global commitment to leverage the impact of the work of the GBV Action Coalition as a multi-stakeholder platform to, to drive progress and accountability and to meet the goals set by the call to action on protection for, from gender-based violence roadmap by 2025. Today, what is quite needed is an acceleration of action, of political will, and an increase in smart data-driven driven investment. Ending GBV is not only the right thing to do, but also a smart investment to make, and it's surely possible. One of the most effective strategies to reduce gender-based violence and eliminate gender inequalities from our practice is involving everyone in the process. And by everyone, I mean everyone. Men being part of the problem, they cannot be excluded from the solution. Men as allies, as perpetrators, and victims should be part of the equation of achieving equality. ABAD, since its establishment in 2011, strives to educate, raise awareness, support survivors, shift social norms and policies to prevent and effectively respond to gender-based violence. One of the major achievements of our work 
was actually abolishing Article 522, which is marrying your rapist law. We're working with men as stakeholders, legislators, policymakers, religious leaders, and neutralizing possible opposition through sensitization and negotiation pre-campaigning was key and an essential condition to achieve the desired change. The day we make gender-based violence a real concern to all is the day where we will witness a real reduction, if not complete elimination of GBV around the globe. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we led a campaign, Lockdown, Not Look Up, where we engaged every single citizen around uh, on the Lebanese territory to write solidarity messages on balconies, on white sheets, to women locked behind the doors and spreading the safe line, our 24-7 helpline. And in only three, four days, we were able to reach out to more than 100 women survivors of GBV and domestic violence locked behind the doors through the engagement and the mobilization of women and men of municipalities, of faith-based groups located in every single community. Today, we, we should be witnessing a real transformative change when everyone is implicated, women and men side by side, to end really a global public health issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita, and also for being very uh, to the point. Uh, I, there's so many interesting points being raised that it's hard to summarize, but I think uh, you know, you've reminded us of the importance of bringing men and boys uh, uh, along and engaging them as partners. You've also mentioned some groups that we haven't mentioned very specifically, such as faith leaders and municipalities. We tend to always think of government at a higher level, but clearly there's a lot of opportunities for partnerships and work uh, at, the, at the local uh, and municipality level. And lastly, I think the importance of, of, of um, communication and information and engaging the broader society in understanding the issue and seeing themselves as part of the solution. So lots and lots of interesting points being raised by all panelists. Um, but I'm going to move straight uh, to our next panelist, Nicolette Taylor who's the International Program Director for Gender, Racial and Ethnic Justice um, at the Ford Foundation, representing the, the president of the Ford Foundation here, uh, to tell us, talk to us about what the vision uh, is for the role of philanthropic organizations, such as the Ford Foundation, uh, as enablers of multi-stakeholder partnerships. What do you see as the most significant challenges and opportunities for a new model of decision-making and investment uh, to move forward in addressing GBV. Over to you, Nicolette. I think as a foundation working to address inequality, we believe that gender inequality Nicolette, sorry to interrupt you. Could you get a little bit closer to your mic? You're cutting off. Better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. So as a foundation working to address inequality, we believe that gender inequality and gender violence are really linked. So the first point, I've just got five points to make. Is The first point is we see GBV as structural inequality issue. And we also recognize that if we're going to have any impact as philanthropy, we cannot do this alone. Addressing GBV has to involve multiple stakeholders across different sectors, including the private sector, governments, multilateral institutions, and feminist movements, all working in partnership. And this requires coordination and collaboration nationally, regionally, and globally. Most importantly, we have to ensure that the women and girls in all their diversity and those survivors that are most affected by violence have to be at the center of our interventions. Our vision of success at the Ford Foundation is therefore about investing in these types of new partnerships. We hope to see a common agenda, an action plan that we can all buy into, act upon, and hold ourselves accountable to. The third point I want to make is that we have to heed the, the Secretary General's call to build back better. 
But I think we also have to be sure to build back better from the bottom up, from local to regional to global, where we work together to end gender-based violence in less fragmented ways and less competitive ways, and where we make the compromises that we need to in a time of global crisis. The fourth point is that we have to invest in women and girls who are working at the front line, and we have to work to strengthen and support global multilateral both at yeah. local and at the UN level. So for us, the Global South Women's Rights and Feminist Organizations they have to be prioritized and listened to and be treated as equal partners as we chart a way forward that speaks to our commitment and belief in a reformed global multilateral system. And I think the Action Coalition process and the Spotlight Initiative, and we're proud to be part of the Action Coalition process, provides us with these opportunities where we can model these new ways of working. The last point I want to make is that philanthropy and donors have to play a supportive role as opposed to being the main actors where we're imposing our views and our savior models on communities around the world. We have to build bridges between survivors, women's rights organizations, governments, and so we can all work together in the supportive way. And the most important thing philanthropy can do is leverage more resources for the work on gender-based violence and make sure that we make the connections between COVID and gender-based violence and also gender-based violence and the multiple forms of discrimination that women and girls face, whether it's on the basis of race or ethnicity or class or citizenship, or disability and sexual orientation. So our resources ultimately have to be channeled in ways that do no harm, that's grounded in evidence-based approaches, and we have to make sure that our resources actually reach women and girls on the front lines and make sure that they don't only survive beyond COVID, but they thrive and are sustainable beyond COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolette, for reminding us, uh, firstly, that it's about thriving, not just surviving. I think that is a very critical and important thing to always keep in mind. And I think, as you highlighted, that the the, the beauty, in a, in a way, of philanthropic organizations, and they played a very important role both during the ICPD and the Beijing conferences in catalyzing uh, movements um, around human rights of women, around sexual and reproductive health issues, uh, is to, to be able to, to build those bridges that you were saying and uh, help bring coherence. I also would like to highlight the importance of evidence-based programming um, and bringing a uh, innovative partnerships. And I do think we're all of us who are part of the Action Coalition are really looking to this partnership as a new uh, model uh, that will help hopefully to build a five-year, 10-year forward-looking plan that can take us forward in this process. Um, I'm moving now to Kalpana Viswanath, um, who is the co-founder and CEO of Safety Pin, which is a global coalition on inclusive and safe spaces and cities. Um, we've talked a lot, uh, Kalpana, about the importance of civil society, and you represent uh, a, a coalition of civil society and women's rights organizations, um, and who have continued to demonstrate leadership in this area of prevention response in spite of the shrinking economic resources. So I'd like you to share with us what role um, can um, organizations like yours play in multi-stakeholder partnerships? How can, uh, would you like to be supported um, to do this work? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very happy to speak at this very important event on behalf of the Global Coalition on Safe and Inclusive Cities, which includes 
the Women in Cities International, Wairu Commission, the Women in Habitat Network of Latin America, Jagodi and Safety Pin. To answer your question, um, women's rights organizations, <laughs> grassroots groups and civil society groups have been at the forefront in the multiple dimensions of gender-based violence, as well as developing innovative responses. But to address the systemic nature of GBV, we need to have a transformat transformative vision, practice, and politics. 25 years ago, the Beijing Platform for Action spoke about transformative actions that challenge and alter the power dynamics that underpin gender inequality. The work on safer and gender equitab equitable cities that many of us have been uh, doing over the past two decades offers an example of gender transformative politics that interrogates the dominant model of urbanization as one of exclusion and inequality. To do this effectively, a multi-stakeholder and multi-strategic approach has been used. This includes addressing urban design and planning, infrastructure, mobility, essential services, services for survivors of GBV, policing campaigns, changing gender norms, generating data, as well as harnessing technology and the digital space. Women's rights groups have led this transformation by shifting the responsibility of creating safety and inclusion from individual women to a wide range of stakeholders, including municipal governments, private sector, and the media, among others. This has resulted in cities across the world implementing innovative programs for gender inclusion. UN Women, WHO, and others have pointed out that the Safe Cities approach has shown evidence as an effective prevention approach. In the context of COVID-19, where urban centers have been deeply affected across the world, it has been a challenge to address the gendered fallouts including increased violence against women. Uh, many uh, speakers have talked about uh, policies and actions, but the UN database gender tracker shows that there has been limited policy responses from governments and inadequate financial resources to both address GBV, support the work of care and strengthen economic security for women in this period. In many countries, it has been the CSOs, grassroots groups, and women's rights groups who have struggled to support women in these difficult times. It is important to recognize that women's rights groups, community-based organizations, and grassroots groups of women have played and continue to play a vital role based on deep knowledge of women's very complex lives, marginalities, and vulnerabilities. Therefore, an intersectional perspective is crucial to ensure the voices of the most excluded are not only heard, but have a seat at the table. In the context of shrinking resources and backlash that women's act rights activists are facing in many countries, we need governments and the UN and international organizations to step up to provide financial resources and other forms of support. To end, I quote Caroline Moser, who says that gender transformation, transformation is in, an inherently political act that emphasizes collective action, contestation, and negotiation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kalpana. Um, We've come to the end of this really very exciting panel. I, I think all of the interventions have been really rich in content and I'm not even be, begin to try to summarize, but maybe pick up, pick up on just a, a couple of the points that you just made, Kalpan, and which have come on in. Um, I think both you and um, uh, in, uh, um, have raised the importance of negotiation. And I think, uh, you know, that sometimes in the face of backlash, uh, we have to engage in a more um, concerted way with a lot of patience and perseverance uh, in, in, in processes that uh, with um, stakeholders that we may not uh, initially feel uh, very um, close to. So I think it's an important thing when we think of these multi-stakeholders 
uh, that sometimes we do have to include in those multi-stakeholder uh, uh, agreements and negotiations, um, people that may not necessarily share our values and the process of awareness raising, um, you know, uh, norm change, et cetera, it's very, in a transformative way, as you've just mentioned, is very important. I think the second issue I would highlight from the various of the presentations is around the importance of taking into account all forms of discrimination and, in, and inequality and the intersecting, um, intersecting disadvantages so that we are not um, excluding any of those voices and really making sure that those voices, as you just said, are at the table, not only just heard through others, but really be, bring them to the table. Um, two more points I'm going to make that have not been made. Uh, one that was made by um, the minister from Spain that I thought was interesting. Uh, she mentioned also how well, the initial work on domestic violence around the lockdown and COVID has expanded to also address issues of trafficking and um, sexual exploitation and abuse. So again, another form of multi-stakeholder uh, linkage is between groups working on different forms of violence, um, different forms of discrimination. And um, lastly, also the importance of sustainable funding and particularly sustainable funding to civil society and to all the organizations that have really been at the backbone of all this work. Um, there's an incredible richness in both of the panels that we've heard today. I think in the examples that we heard of innovative and promising um, actions that have been undertaken around COVID, we have heard about different forms of partnerships. And we need to take this opportunity to continue to build those partnerships, create new partnerships and strengthen the existing ones so that we take the, the opportunity that we have in front of us to move forward, not just for the immediate crisis of COVID, but also for the future. Thank you all for uh, sustaining yourselves and keeping with us. And uh, without more ado, I think I would just like to thank all the panelists for your really insightful comments. And I'll hand back to Rula um, to give us the closing comments. Thank you all. Thank you, Claudia. Um, and thank you for your continued attention here in the United States and around the world. We're almost at the end of our event today. I would like to thank all the participants with us today who participated virtually or via video message for their engagement, commitment, and passion to end gender-based violence. If COVID-19 pandemic taught us anything and shows us, showed us anything, that we are able to mobilize, to transform, and shape our societies when lives of human beings depend on it. It also shown us that women can and should be leader in this effort. We would like to see the same level of determination to end violence against girls and women once and for all. We can all play a part in this fight and we should count and we would like to count on each other, also on men in participating to end this plight. I would like to remind everybody that still in our world, there are so many women that are locked down by force. And I'm talking about women rights activists. As we seek this journey to end violence against women, let's remember women rights activists who are jailed, tortured, sexually assaulted for the only crime of demanding basic rights. I urge the international community to commit with the same level of determination to end this pandemic of violence against women all over the world. We all, again, can play a role. I would like to thank personally the brave mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, and London's mayor, Sadiq Khan, for withdrawing from the upcoming G20 summit in Saudi Arabia and urging other mayors around the world to do the same thing. 
until the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, releases women rights activists who are held in jail for basically driving, which is the law of the land now. It's legal in Saudi Arabia. Regardless, these women, especially Lujain al-Hathloul, who's 20 years old, 28 years old, she's been in jail for three years. She's been arrested simply for driving. This woman has been sexually assaulted according to her family and her news totally disappeared. And I would like to conclude with the words of a hero, Martin Luther King, who said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So protect justice and defend women. Thank you all for participating today. And I would like to end this by giving the floor back to you and women. And I'd like to turn over the floor to my apologies to Under Secretary General for a final reflections on today's work. Thank you again. Thank you so much uh, for managing uh, this uh, very interesting uh, day uh, in such an able way. Thank you to all the participants, uh, to all the speakers for a very enlightening a conversation, a lessons learned, a challenges uh, that we're still facing, but also uh, for the strength that uh, you are showing in this difficult time and the determination uh, not and never to fall backwards, but to fall forwards in every way uh, you work. Uh, I think the summaries of the key points have been made very able, so I will not uh, repeat because uh, we are so out of time. But I do want to emphasize uh, the importance of partnership, which is at the heart of the action coalitions. We have uh, in this uh, session today, both a representative of the AU in the form of South Africa, as well as uh, the, the, the EU, two large regional groups. I think uh, it is important that uh, we mobilize uh, the convening capacity of groups like this and many others uh, to use their convening power uh, to generate uh, interest and buy-in in all of these. I certainly uh, also welcome the voice of young people and uh, we certainly need to hear more young voices uh, in this struggle because indeed uh, the large number of people who are also living and facing violence every day uh, are young and they do have their own way of uh, uh, addressing the issues that uh, we need to learn as well as we support each other um, in this work. Um, we also must emphasize the fact that the funding that is going to fight uh, uh, men's violence against women is still very inadequate, not proportional to the size of the problem. So while we have a, a collective anger about this crime that is perpetuated against women, we are yet to see collective commitment to actually invest and finance uh, the different actors, especially women-led initiatives uh, that would assist us to take these uh, matters uh, forward. And of course, uh, I would like to uh, also end this uh, uh, closing message by something uh, more pleasant, highlighting the fact that uh, today Togo uh, appointed a woman prime minister. So we are increasing the number of people that are hopefully going to be uh, at the top and fight uh, for our causes. Thank you.
over. This is the end of our day. Uh, thank you so much for all the participants from around the world. Onward, upward, and the march to freedom is long, but always bends toward justice. So let's work together. So next year in New York City, when this pandemic is over, the other pandemics can be over as well. Yes, we're trying to find vaccines so we can all be safe and travel. I hope we can find pre preventative measures and change the culture that leads to violence against women. Thank you everybody in the United States and around the world. I would like to thank all the organizations, uh, all the people who work behind the scenes to make this event uh, accessible to everybody. And I'd like to thank the United Nations Women Organizations and all the stakeholders, all the participants, and see you next year in New York City. Thank you.